Thank you very much, Jason, for this very kind introduction. Let me try to share my screen. Um, do you see anything? Like now, for example. Do you see anything, Jason? Uh, That's great. great. Yeah, okay, okay, good. Yeah, so uh, like Jason mentioned, I'm a computer scientist and I don't have data of my own. And usually I'm invited to meetings like this to talk about the algorithms that we developed to process biological data. But I thought that this time it would probably be more interesting for you not to talk about what we do, but about how we do it and about the stuff that kind of goes around it that is completely left out of all the papers and you know about the things that actually make it all work. So I want to concentrate on the large 3D data sets now because this is kind of what we mostly do in our group. And the reason is that well, if you look at different, ah, sorry, yes. So if you look at the different large microscopy data sets, and of course we are talking about large data sets here because I don't think anyone has problems with storing small data sets. So for us, the big difference comes in the, well, you can have very many small 2D images, like in the high content, high throughput screenings, like we have seen yesterday, right, which is, you know, each of these images could be a very challenging image analysis problem, but parallelizing it is not difficult, right? Because all the images are independent, each image fits in RAM, so you basically just submit all those jobs per image, they all come back, everything is good. This is not exactly what we are doing or like what we sort of specialize in. So what we like to work on is few or just one very large 3D volumes. And that is difficult because the data doesn't fit into RAM. We have to process blockwise. So you have to use some kind of MapReduce-like approaches, scatter, gather, whatever you want, however you want to call it, which also means that the data, and I already say that now, even though half of my talk is actually about this, has to be supporting of partial or chunkwise reading and writing, and this is for us very, very important. Now, if you want to see what is actually happening in there, or you know, why we have to support that, is that, well, if you look at a pipeline example for a segmentation of electron microscopy, so all these steps by now are updated from the paper from 2017, but the essence stays the same, right? So you have the raw data, then you do boundary prediction, which happens with the neural network usually, you break that up into super pixels, you do a final agglomeration. And so this is a pretty difficult problem, but if you now slowly go step by step, right? If you look at the boundary prediction part, right? This is usually done with the neural network, right? The neural network outputs some multi-channel output, doesn't matter. In our case, pixel affinity scores. It needs to run on a GPU, obviously. And that part is actually very easy to parallelize, right? So this is embarrassingly parallel. You need a little bit of an overlap to not have the blocking artifacts, but in principle, all blocks are independent, right? So the only thing you have to kind of keep in mind here is that if you want to use our tools or if you want to collaborate with us on your data, it means that your data has to be stored somewhere that we can access from the GPU nodes. And if you don't have GPU nodes and have to use the ones from the cloud, that means that your data has to be somehow cloud ready. But that was the GPU part. Then if you already have boundaries, you, well, you do super pixels, some kind of watershed variant that runs on a CPU. This is not so easy to parallelize, but this is not, you know, not a complete killer. Still, we need parallel reading and parallel writing for that, right? And then finally, there is this step in the end, which agglomerates all the super pixels into complete objects which is yeah, graph-based clustering, also runs on the CPU. This is actually a research problem, right? So parallelizing this kind of algorithms is really non-trivial. We have a paper about this. I'm sure it could even be done better. And uh, you need pyramids for this, and you would probably do some kind of a multi-stage agglomeration with first merging the blocks at full resolution, then going down and down, always looking at the boundary. You still need parallel reading and writing with pyramid support. To summarize this part, in what we would need to have to work on a fairly big 3D data set, we need random access to parts of data and we determine the size of this part that we would need to read at one time, so like chunks. We need highly parallel reading. We also really need highly parallel writing. And this is something that is very rarely supported by the image formats. Right? We need pyramids because Otherwise, you know, you can't fit a single block sometimes even if you have, if you need to work on four blocks because you're merging them, you have to go in a pyramid-like fashion. And for the processing itself, well, it works asynchronously on blocks, but it has to be synchronized between the different pyramids levels as you go. And the whole system needs to be robust to the block level failure. 
So you might think that this is actually a fairly sophisticated algorithm and what you want to do with your data is much simpler. But actually, if you look at a simpler example, right? So suppose that you want to look at a Drosophila embryo in 3D, segment all the nuclei. And if you think of a pipeline that is as easy as you can think of, but still remember that you work with large data. And when I say large, I mean, well, let's say more than 100 gigabytes. And so if you want to do that, well, you start with Gaussian smoothing. That is almost like a CNN. It's a convolutional filter. It's embarrassingly parallel. Well, if you actually have more than 100 gigabytes, it's probably worth it to invest into a GPU to run something like this. Then you do thresholding, which is simple, easy to parallelize, but not so trivial if you want to have a size filter in there. And then finally, you have a connected component step, which is also surprisingly hard to parallelize, especially if you, you know, if you have objects where you cannot assume anything about their size. So if you have like a spiral filling the whole block, I, this is not easy and also has to be done in a pyramid fashion, which essentially means that if we go back and look at our requirements, it's all the same. I, you still need random access to parts. You still need hardy parallel reading and highly parallel writing and pyramids and the processing that takes all of that into account. So what I want to really emphasize here is that once you go into sufficiently large data, nothing is really simple anymore. I had no Gaussian filter, no thing can really be trivial. Right, so you really need to think of what you're doing. What data formats could support us in this? Well, I don't even go into the closed formats because you know we are not using that. Nothing stuff that cannot be read by bioformats is as good as formats only. Am I really muted now? Why? Why did it say that? You, you were yeah. muted for a second, but you're back, Annika. Ah, okay. Go All right. Sorry about that. However, that happened. Yeah. So. I believe only TIFF is actually supporting slices and it is pyramidal, not chunked in XY. They actually need this, but it also, it has monolithic files. So H5, which has been our format of choice for a long time, supports arbitrary chunking. This is great. So we can always read out little blocks, never have to read out the whole slice at a time. You can store pyramids if you yeah, have a way to address them again. H5 is actually used inside most softwares that are capable of dealing with large 3D data. So in our own Elastic, also in Big Data Viewer, in Imaris, and many others. The big problem with H5 is that parallel writing is very slow. So it's basically not parallel. And well, another problem is that again, like N5 or ZAR, it produces monolithic files. So monolithic files are a problem if you want to access it from the cloud. Right, so now, if you look at the current stars, so to say, right, so the formats which are really gaining attention now and where all the people are switching to, that would be N5, ZAR, and TileDB. So we don't have much experience with TileDB, but we really like N5 and ZAR. And there, the reason why we like them is, well, they do support very fast parallel reading and writing. Also, what is very important to us, it's uh, open. It has simple and stable Python API, Python API, so we can always address it from our code. It is now readable from Fiji. I believe that was merged. It's cloud ready. And what is also very important is that they are developed and supported by institutes which themselves take very large amounts of data. So N5 is an engineer, for example. So we know that they will keep being developed the right way. So we have almost exclusively switched now to using N5 and we have been very, very happy with that. So for a smaller project, we still use H5. And I don't think we have used anything else for the last two years at all. Right? And if something else comes, we just recode it immediately. But of course, that also multiplies your data storage size. Okay, now you see how we need the data and what it's supposed to look like when it gets to us. Maybe let's now take a quick look at how the collaboration would actually happen. So if you come to us with a big data set, let's say a few terabytes, and you want that segmented, so how would we go about it? Right, so the development process is the first thing we do is we look, have we ever processed data like this before? Because for creating new training data, this is very important. So now that we have been here for two years, we have looked at all kinds of data, but still there's always new stuff. And here I just wanted to show it on this, yeah, Arabidopsis Lutic example from Alexei Mizel's lab, but it's, um, yeah, it's a general approach, right? So we start from the raw data. If not, if we have never done anything like this, we go to Elastic, then 
so here we have the elastic out of context workflow results where we predict the boundaries. We have the multicut workflow results. The good thing about this is that both work from very sparse labels. If you wanted to train a neural network, you would have to really segment a whole 3D block. And this takes a lot of time. So this is just kind of our shortcut to get a segmentation and then correct the segmentation instead of really sitting there and painting little boundaries in 3D. So we get the first segmentation from Elastic. Then we go off to the Paintera tool that was uh, done by Stefan Salfit in Genelia, and we correct this first version of the segmentation. And then with that, we actually train the first neural network. Right, then we have a better boundary prediction. We run the agglomeration again. We get a better segmentation. Of course, still not perfect. Like you can see this big false merge in the middle, but still this is already better than what we had before. We train on that and then we iterate and iterate and the complete thing looks like this. Right, so you start from raw and then you go between this 3A, 3B and 3C. You kind of yeah, go over this until you have results which look okay. Then for training data, we can just use that. But since this is all automatically produced, you probably still need to have this final round of corrections to have the really 100% correct data. And then once you have that, we can actually start development. So yeah, the development process itself, what we need is the labels for the machine learning part. Right, and here, yeah, we use Elastic and then Paintera, and we iteratively correct that ourselves if we understand the problem well enough and if we have the time, or the collaborators do it if it's actually difficult in the images. So even if we have training data from other data sets or we can somehow repurpose other stuff that we have, we still need validation data. Right? And validation data really has to be proofread to, let's say, very good accuracy. And it has to be different from training. And this really has to be the data set that you want. So, and that validation data we are going to use to see if the algorithm is doing any good. So once we have the training data, just keep in mind that for say a decent data set and a decent amount of labels with 3D neural network, it usually takes two or three days to train, up to a week if you really want to wait long and get very nice results. And then after you have it trained, and of course we train on small sub volumes, it still takes a few days to just apply it to a data set of a few terabytes, even if you have reasonable computational resources like we do here. Right? It just takes a while to chew through all of this, apply the algorithm, and then write out the results. And so that's how we go for creating the results. And yeah, for the data itself, just so that we have somewhere to write these results and to share them with you, what we need to have is, yeah, so we need the data to be versioned because you will probably bring us the raw data or our collaborators bring us the raw data. Then there is some pre-processing that can probably also happen in a different lab um, where you would do whatever registration, alignment, pre-filtering, I don't know. Then our part comes. Then there is the final analysis where you would extract things out of the segmented objects or maybe track or maybe do some biology on top. And all of this needs to be in sync. And when you're constantly operating with these really large volumes, things get out of sync very quickly because we also have a lot of volumes and a lot of intermediate steps. So we now use GitHub to kind of watch over it, but that's something that should not come in the end once you realize that you have no idea how different parts correspond to each other. Right? So this really, you have to think about this from the beginning. And then another thing to keep in mind when you think about your storage and when you get ambitious and decide that you want to take the multi-terabyte data sets, is that as you go for all the intermediate steps, you need about 10 times the raw data and 10 times is like a conservative estimate. So you could actually need more. So 10 times is what we keep around just not to recompute for stuff for a week. Okay, so suppose that we have all this, right? We have the version data and we have the training data and we have the validation data and we have some algorithm results and you have run something on them and then your colleagues have run something. It's all together. We can relate different parts to each other. Everything is good. How do we actually look at it? And this is the part where I wanted to talk about the work that is actually not my own, but the work of Kristen Tischer, who is doing the bioimage analysis service at Amble, and with whom we, of course, collaborate very closely on very many projects. And yeah, Constantine from my lab is also helping him on this one. And here, so this is the tool called MOBI, which stands for Multimodal Big Image Data Sharing and Exploration. And this is indeed what it does. It enables data sharing and exploration. So the tools that we do, like Elastic or our deep learning tools, they are all really targeting the processing. 
right? So we are trying to make them accessible and we try to do it so that our users can run it without our involvement, but this is still really processing. While Mobi is really for looking at data and exploring data and doing things together on data. And yeah, so this is a Fiji plugin, which is based on Big Data Viewer. Um, it allows you to, bro to browse raw and derived data, which is stored as H5 or N5, or probably the Big Data Viewer format, which is internally H5. You can have object level tables with values. You can have 3D rendering, bookmarks, all the great stuff. I'm going to show it to you in more detail. And I want to show it to you um, on a particular project, which is what we call Platy Browser. So this is the instance of this yeah, viewer for the analysis of a Platinaris data set. And yeah, so this is the data set in question. You see, it's a very big collaboration, a lot of people involved, really, really fun project. And in this project, we were looking at a data set, which was comprised of a whole animal EM volume. So pretty big, like around two terabytes, I think, the whole thing. And then also the gene expression for the animal at the same stage for around 200 genes, also obtained as images by whole mound fish. So they've been by Christian registered into the same space. So you can look at them together. And on our part, we have done the segmentation of cells and of the nuclei. And then Mobi as a tool here was used to actually bring all of these modalities together and to analyze the gene expression on the single cell level and yeah, other fun things like this. So here you can see an example of looking at the gene expression data in B, right? And at the segmentation data in C. So you can see that you can really explore it and you can, for the segmented objects, you can explore their properties and import them as tables and have them all in there and then order by tables and color by tables and do all kinds of exploration like that. You can look at the gene expression around your object and then most importantly, you can really do it all together. So you can look at the objects in 3D, right? And at the same time, explore what genes are expressed around them. And you can import your own properties and compute properties of the objects. And this way, share your analysis with the others. And um, there, in just a, in a quick video, I wanted to show you how the annotations there work, because you can also assign properties to objects as you browse. And for us, that was also a very important thing for people to, for our collaborators to generate the annotations that we need for uh, for training and for exploring the data, but also for them to then look at it and do the biology on top. So what you can see here is the cell type annotations. So these were all neurons, and then you can create a different category like muscle, right? And then you go on and then you click there. And you have to remember that the EM data set that is in the background of this is, I think when everything is cut down around two terabytes, right? And then there are all these 205 channels of the light data which are put on top. And all of this is just running on your machine with the data being streamed, well, in this case, from an S3 instance at Embo. And then you can see that you can click, you can assign, you can export it afterwards. And then once it's exported, you can, for example, ship it to us and say, look, I labeled those interesting cells. Or you could say, look, I labeled these cells that were totally wrong. You guys have to do a better job segmenting them or something else like this. Right. So yeah, like I said, it also makes the sharing of data very easy because you can just have the S3 storage and then image J on your laptop, right? So you have your Fiji with the plugin and then you can do everything on the laptop with the data being stored there. And once you are ready to publish the data, you just make this S3 storage publicly accessible and you're done. So for us, this has really been very, very important for the large collaborative projects to have a simple way to visualize data like this and to look at it with our colleagues. Now to summarize the whole stack, what we need to work on very large data is we need file formats which support, which support highly, parallel, highly parallel reading and writing, which right now are N5 and ZAR mostly. Right? We need data to be versioned so that we could sync between the stuff that you do on the data that we do and that people do in the post-processing. Then of course, there is this part that we actually bring, which is our own algorithms, which are in Python and C++, which we scale up to run on clusters or on the cloud with our own tools or with Luigi and Dusk and so on. Then there is Mobi that's developed by Christian for exploration of data and of the results. And then once we are done with all of this and uh, you know, once a project is finished, then we can actually wrap the algorithm into Elastic for the next users to use. So yeah, that was mainly what I wanted to show so that you would get an idea of how the algorithm development on this very large data happens in a highly collaborative manner. So yeah, 
thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer questions. I'll do the clap, Anna. <laughs> thank I'm you. Sure. There's lots of clapping uh, appearing in the, in the window. So thank you. That was great. Amazing tour. I think uh, resonates very much with what we're seeing in our own projects in ONI and uh, many others are seeing, as, as you mentioned. So I'm going to go over to the chat window and just start. Um, first of all, I'll welcome Anne Carpenter back. It's great to see you, Anne. Uh, and you, you made an interesting comment there. Do you want to um, uh, turn on your video and follow up on that? Just in terms of this, you know, you know how powerful all of this is, but how, how difficult it is? Uh, yeah, so it, it looks like I can't start my video because I'm not a host, but I can uh, certainly um, just uh, comment to Anna that um, you did a great job explaining attention that I often see, which is that on the one hand, there's this promise of deep learning and it works so beautifully. And when you can get it going, uh, it, it just works so wonderfully. But on the other hand, you're, you've shown behind the curtain the, the ugly logistics that are involved. So, like nothing is, a lot of the things are not that hard, but somehow it's just, it, you accumulate a bunch of small steps and it just becomes a very big workflow. And uh, I, I think that's really the, the key limitation right now for biologists being able to just sit down and use these kinds of, of tools in a, in a convenient and independent manner, let's say. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's, that's what it is. There is a lot of stuff that is just kind of naturally growing around the algorithm that uh, to be able to run it and to produce the final results. And it's important to, you know, on the one hand, yes, we don't put it in papers because everyone solves it for themselves, but it's, yeah, it's important to remember that it's there and it takes time and it takes resources, uh, both computational and storage. And yeah, it also, yeah, nothing is immediate there and nothing comes for free. Thank you. Um, just going down the list here, Andrea Andreev, um, all the way from Los Angeles, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you might not want to turn on your camera again, but do you want to ask your questions? See that? Now oh, they say it's still 4 a.m., but maybe I, yeah, so I can read it out, right? So how many biological samples are required to train? It's impossible to say without seeing the data. Right? So it really depends on the variability. And um, you know, if you have 10,000 images and they all look the same, we could go from one. Right? If you have serious changes inside, then yeah, we need a little bit of everything. So that's why it is an iterative process. Like I said in this image, which showed how we train, right? this 3A, 3B, 3C and how it's going on. Right? You try on a small set, then if it doesn't work, you correct there, you edit to the training set, you try on another small cutout, if it doesn't work there, you correct there, edit to a training set. At some point, you're just sick of it and you're like, okay, maybe that's enough. So, yeah, that's how it is. <laughs> Great. Um, Yum, okay. Question about data versioning? Um, data versioning. Yeah, maybe. maybe ah, yeah. How, how do we manage data versioning? Well, you know, everyone, of course, starts from this, you know, data folder underscore one, two, three, final, final, final. Uh, afterwards, usually we go for Git after this. So, so far that's been working well enough. But um, yeah, I, it's like, I don't even have recipes there. It's just keep it in mind, right? This is very important because once you get out of sync and you basically then you have this whole basket of irreproducible images that don't link to the rest of the pipeline and you have to find the good first one and rerun the complete pipeline. So however you do it, you know, give it descriptive names, use Git, whatever works, just make sure that you can keep track. Um, yeah, uh, final, final Tuesday, really good. Use this for paper number one. Yep. <laughs> uh, one from Ken Ho from Rikin. Um 3D models. Uh, no, uh, we like for rendering. Yeah, I mean for rendering we can, right? So yeah, we we basically we re-render in the segmentation, right? So we compute the mesh, and we don't really use that for deep learning, right? So the deep learning that we use is three D, right? So the convolutions are done in three D, but it's the way what we do is always on pixels. But there are people who have really mesh networks. It's just like yeah, we don't do this. Thanks. Or, Comment from Anne Begin, apparently you're a lifesaver, Anna, so I guess that's well, good. Well, yeah, thank you. 
It's a great thing that we're doing here at Global Bioenergy. Um, comment from Josh Moore. I think uh, the Josh, I don't know if you want to add anything there. N5 and Zar are definitely coming on line in many places. Um, okay. There's Josh. Yeah, I mean, to the to the extent that we're all having these same problems, so it would be good to keep these conversations going forward. There have been various Twitter threads and discussions on Image SC that everyone's welcome to join in on. Um, ultimately, so these are big, hard problems, and we need kind of low-level infrastructure to to solve it for all of us. So, um, you know, have visited with Tishi and others at Imbol discussing the same problems. I probably every institute is having them. Um, you know, how do you make, how do you link up your storage with your big data and the versioning and, you know, and all of us have tools that work against them. So, um, the more we can work to, on that together, the better. Yeah. And I think as soon as you start getting non-trivial amounts of data that you want to process in non-trivial ways, I, this problem just hits you, you can't avoid it. So maybe it's better to you know, hear the experience of people who've been, who have been there already and just switch to the new formats preemptively and not waste space storing your multiple terabytes in five different formats because this is what the, you know, one is the microscope, the other one is the backup, and then for processing you need this and for visualization you need that. So yeah, I think these discussions are very useful. That's right. And I kind of just, I'm going to just say something. I just emphasize the points you made. All of this is open source. All of it is available to the community, correct? Yeah. Okay. So um, it's probably important to emphasize. Um, that, um, there's nothing else. Um, I guess Chris Wood, you've got a comment there, which is consistent with others. Is there anything you want to um, uh, go forward with that or anything you want to add there? Well, it was, it was just following on from a bit from the talk yesterday. It was something I mentioned that, that um, yeah, this sort of client terminal access to remote repository database our data, there's, there's really not going to be much options. I mean, 200,000, you know, or whatever, uh, $10,000, $20,000 workstations for processing data is just not really an option for, for large areas. And then, and then you just watch them slowly go obsolete um, and they need uh, replacing every, you know, five, 10 years or whatever. So, it's 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 the only option that's going to be available in, 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 in all of these tools that, and, that, that facilitate that access and and stream into sort of a client uh, uh, local workstation or local computer is just absolutely what we need by the way elastic is great we've, we've, we've just uh, started incorporating it in our um, in our teaching uh, to the students and it's uh, a wonderful tool I recommend anyone who's not used it yet to, to, to have a look. There's a really good uh, video on Nubius, which was from about April, May, instructional video for beginners, which we followed and uh, having a really good time with it. So thanks. Thank thanks uh, for that. Okay. okay. Anna, thank you for an amazing uh, start to the day. I appreciate it. And oh, thank um, you. again, one final clap. You all can click on your happy hand. Um, it's great.